In July 1929, Montreal Locomotive Works rolled out number 5900. 375 tons of steel, 10 driving wheels, and a boiler running at pressures most railroads would not dare touch. Canadian Pacific did not build this machine for flatland work. They built it for Rogers Pass. The Rocky Mountains had broken lesser locomotives for decades, grades that climbed at 2.2%, steeper than anything Union Pacific's big boys would ever see on Sherman Hill. Curves so tight the rails bent into 12-degree arcs, forcing engineers to throttle back just to keep wheels from screaming against the inside rail. Trains had to move regardless. Freight tonnage passenger consists, mail contracts that could not wait for helper engines or double-heading operations. Henry Bowen, Canadian Pacific's chief of motive power, had watched smaller locomotives struggle up Field Hill for years. 462 Pacifics nursing their way through the spiral tunnels with sanders wide open and fireboxes glowing white. The railroad needed something that could hit those grades alone and come back for more the next day. No helpers, no excuses. The Selkirk delivered 78,000 pounds of tractive effort, and the booster could add roughly another 12,000 pounds at low speed. Raw pulling force was distributed across 10 driving wheels, each 63 inches tall. The wheel arrangement kept axle loading within limits that would not tear up the track, even when those wheels were biting into a 2.2% climb with 1,000 tons behind the tender. Montreal Locomotive Works pushed the boiler design harder than most American builders would accept. The first batch ran at 275 pounds per square inch. Later builds ran at 285 pounds per square inch. Most railroads kept their large power at 250, maybe 260, if they were feeling aggressive. Canadian Pacific went higher because Rogers Pass did not care about conservative engineering practices. Oil firing eliminated the problems coal created in mountain territory. 12,000 imperial gallons of water sat in the tender alongside 4,100 gallons of fuel oil. That capacity gave them the range to work the Calgary to Revelstoke route with far fewer fuel and water stops than earlier power. No coal dust choking crews in the long tunnels. No ash to clean from fireboxes at every service point. One fireman could manage the burner controls where coal firing would have needed two men working in shifts. The experimental locomotive number 8000, built in 1930 with a triple pressure boiler system, proved how much fuel these machines consumed. On test runs against standard Selkirks, that locomotive burned 1,251 imperial gallons of oil and 12,850 gallons of water on a single trip. The locomotive achieved roughly 25% better fuel economy than conventional Selkirks, which means the standard engines were consuming even more. Henry Bowen championed that experimental machine, convinced that higher steam pressure was the future. He was right about the engineering wrong about the economics. Sherman Hill rises at 1.55% westbound on the original Union Pacific alignment. The big boys hauled 3,600 tons up that grade, numbers that looked impressive in railroad publicity departments. Run the calculations. 20 pounds of tractive effort are needed per ton per 1% of grade. Add rolling resistance at roughly 4 pounds per ton. Those 3,600 tons climbing Sherman Hill required about 126,000 pounds of tractive effort. The big boy delivered 135,375 pounds. The reserve margin was 9,375 pounds. That is about 7% extra power for slipping rails or unexpected resistance. Rogers Pass, at 2.2%, demanded different mathematics. The Selkirks, rated for about 1,050 tons on the lesser West Slope grades, needed roughly 60,000 pounds of tractive effort just to overcome the climb and rolling resistance. 12-degree curves meant another 10,000 pounds of resistance. The Selkirks' 78,000 pounds of tractive effort left 17,500 pounds in reserve, a 22% margin, not just moving the train, dominating it. A big boy pulled massive consists on relatively forgiving grades. The Selkirk pulled smaller trains up steeper mountains while maintaining passenger schedules. Neither locomotive was superior. Both solved the specific problems their railroads faced. Montreal Locomotive Works delivered 20 T1A class Selkirks before 1929 ended, numbered 5,900 through 5,919. Heavy and functional. 
Railroads in the late 20s did not care about aesthetics. They cared whether the locomotive could do the job. The T1B class arrived in 1938. Ten locomotives were numbered 5,920 through 5,929. Semi-streamlined casings match the appearance of Canadian Pacific's Royal Hudson passenger locomotives. Tuscan red panels ran along the running boards with gold leaf trim. These machines weighed 10 tons less than the originals, while running higher boiler pressure. A decade of operational experience had taught Montreal Locomotive Works where weight could be cut and where pressure could be increased. The final six came in 1949. The T1C class had numbers 5,930 through 5,935. They were the last standard gauge steam locomotives built for any Canadian railroad. Number 5,935 rolled out of the Montreal shops in March, arriving near the end of Henry Bowen's roughly 20-year tenure as Canadian Pacific's chief of motive power. He had acquired 462 new steam locomotives during that period, while fighting diesel advocates inside his own railroad's management structure. His successor inherited a fleet of modern steam power and orders to replace all of it. Norris Buck Crump, Canadian Pacific's president, believed in diesels the way Bowen believed in steam. The argument wasn't about capability. Steam locomotives worked. The argument was about money. Monthly boiler inspections were federal law. Heavy shopping pulled locomotives out of service for weeks at a time. Steam power averaged 35% availability, 65 days out of every 100 spent either under repair or waiting for maintenance slots. Diesels ran at 95% availability. That difference alone justified the conversion costs. Operating expenses told the rest. Steam locomotives cost 70 cents per mile to run in the 1940s. Diesels did the same work for 31 cents. Labor costs dropped when one diesel unit replaced two or three steam locomotives. Fuel stops vanished when diesel tanks held enough for transcontinental runs. Contemporary railroad reports noted the Selkirks consumed large quantities of fuel and water relative to the tonnage they moved. Capability didn't matter if the accounting department couldn't justify the expense. Dieselization of the Calgary to Revelstoke route was effectively completed by 1954. The Selkirks moved to prairie assignments on the Brooks and Maple Creek subdivisions between Calgary and Swift Current, and on other freight duties on easier grades east and north of Calgary. They faced easier grades, longer consists, and work that did not demand sustained high mountain output. Their appearance changed with their assignments. Tuscan red passenger paint disappeared during heavy shopping at Ogden shops and was replaced with flat black freight livery. Booster engines came off the trailing trucks because they were unnecessary for prairie work and were expensive to maintain. Yellow pinstriping remained, tracing the panels that once carried the railroad's signature colors. The locomotives that had ruled Rogers Pass spent their final years pulling grain trains across the Saskatchewan flatlands. Speed restrictions appeared in 1957. The class was rated at 50 miles per hour, though crews remembered running them at 65 in earlier years. Age, reduced maintenance budgets, and simple caution as steam's end approached all played a role. The last Selkirks left service in 1959. The T1C class operated less than 10 years, short careers that barely gave Canadian Pacific time to recoup their construction costs. 34 went to scrapyards. Cutting torches separated boilers from frames, drivers from axles, everything reduced to steel for remelting. Two survived. Locomotive number 5931 sits at Heritage Park in Calgary, initially misidentified as 5934 during early display years. Locomotive number 5935 rests at Expo Rail, the Canadian Railway Museum in St. Constant, Quebec. No T1A or T1B locomotives escaped scrapping. Only the final class survived. Modern diesel locomotives produce roughly twice the tractive effort while burning less fuel and needing minimal maintenance. A single contemporary unit handles work that once required multiple steam locomotives and their entire support infrastructure. Those 36 Selkirks were purpose-built for the worst grades on the Canadian Pacific system. They succeeded in territory that had defeated earlier designs. For 20 years, nothing in the British Empire matched them for mountain work. The mountains remain, and the grades have not changed. The machines that conquered them exist now only in museums.